most unique events Paul Peck has or will ever have in, an, in its existence. Let it be known that in the year 2020, all live performance has basically come to a halt. It will not be until 2021 at the earliest that mass gatherings of all shapes and sizes can begin again. However, far be it from us to let this pandemic stop one of our most sacred art forms. Uh, lost it. Having been given the honor of hosting one of our Saturday night activities, my dear friends and I have come up with a social distancing float theater performance. We decided to bring to life some short literary works that we think you will all enjoy immensely. Our first story, The Widow's Broom by Chris Van Allsburg, is for our younger viewers. The next two stories, Death by Advertising by the French novelist Emile Zola and the classic Edgar Allan Poe story, The Telltale Heart, are written more for adults but totally acceptable for our younger viewers. Our performance should last about 45 minutes. If during that time you find that you need to head back to your cottage, please do so as quietly as possible. Before we begin, let me please introduce to you Danny Gardner. <laughs> and Emily Larger. <laughs> now normally during this time of year, uh, they would be performing on a professional stage somewhere. Uh, but, uh, you know, unlike me. Uh, so, uh, we're very lucky to have them here with us, and I've been very lucky to have them here with me this summer in our own bubble. Sort of. um, so without further ado, I now present to you our first story, The Widow's Broom. Witches' brooms don't last forever. They grow old, and even the best of them one day lose the power of flight. Fortunately, this does not happen in an instant. A witch can feel the strength slowly leaving her broom. The sudden bursts of energy that once carried her quickly into the sky become weak. Longer and longer running starts are needed for takeoff. Speedy brooms that in their youth outraced hawks are passed by slow flying geese. When these things happen, a witch knows it's time to put her old broom aside and have a new one made. On very rare occasions, however, a broom can lose its power without warning and fall with its passenger to the earth below, which is just what happened one cold autumn night many years ago. Out of a moonlit sky, a dark cloaked figure came spinning to the ground. <laughs> the witch, along with her tired broom, landed behind, beside a small white farmhouse, the home of a lonely widow named Minna Shaw. At daybreak, Widow Shaw discovered the witch lying in her vegetable garden. She was bruised and bloody and couldn't stand up on her own. In spite of her fear and because she was a kind woman, Minna Shaw helped the witch inside and put her to bed. The witch asked Minna Shaw to draw the curtains, then wrapped herself tightly in her black cape and fell soundly asleep. She lay there perfectly still all day and all evening. When she finally awoke at midnight, her wounds had completely healed. She rose from the bed and moved silently through the widow's house. Minna Shaw was asleep in a chair by the fireplace where the embers of a dying fire glowed on in the hearth. The witch knelt and took one of the red hot coals in her hand. Outside, she made a fire of leaves and twigs then dropped a strand of her hair into the flame. The fire hissed and crackled, burning with a brilliant blue light. Before long, the witch could see a dark form flying overhead. It was another witch who circled slowly and landed beside the fire. The two women spoke briefly, the first witch gesturing toward the garden where her old broom rested. Then they sat side by side on the second witch's broom and flew off over the treetops. When Minna Shaw woke up, she wasn't surprised to find her guest had gone. Witches, she knew, had unusual powers. It didn't surprise her either when she saw that the old broom had been left behind. The widow guessed it had lost its magic. It was an ordinary broom now, just like the one she kept in her kitchen. She began using it around the house and found that it was no better or worse than brooms she'd used before. One morning, Minna Shaw was still in bed when she heard a noise coming from the kitchen. She peeked in and saw something that made her heart jump. There was the broom, sweeping the floor all by itself. It stopped for a moment, 
turned to the widow, and then carried on with its work. <laughs> At first, Vinna was frightened, but the broom seemed harmless, and what's more, it was doing a very good job. Unfortunately, it swept all day long. In the evening, to get some peace, she locked the broom in a closet. But when it tapped on the door for more than an hour, Minna felt guilty and she let it out. As she lay in bed listening to the broom sweeping each room over and over, she wondered if it could learn to do other things. In the morning, she led the broom outside and found out that it was a very good student. She needed to show it how to do something only once. Soon the broom could chop wood, <laughs> fetch water, feed the chickens, and bring the cow in from pasture. It could even pick out simple tunes on the piano. Not a week passed before the widow's neighbors, the Spivvies, found out about the broom. Their farm was just down the road, the only other place around. It was one of the eight Spivvy children who saw the broom first. When the boy told his father, Mr. Spivvy ran straight across the road to the widow's house. Is it true? He demanded. Did she really have such a broom? Oh, yes, said Minishaw. It's wonderful. She told her neighbor all about the broom and the witch who'd left it behind. Then she took him around to the back of the house where the broom was hard at work splitting wood. <laughs> Mr. Spivvy was horrified. Well, this is wicked. Well, it's a wicked, wicked thing, he said. This is the devil. The broom stopped working and still clutching the axe, hopped toward the widow and her neighbor. Mr. Spivvy, red faced with anger, turned quickly and hurried home. <sighs> Soon, more distant neighbors heard about the broom and visited the widow's farm. The men who saw it seemed to agree it was probably a wicked thing, but their wives pointed out that it was a great help to the widow and could play the piano well, considering it struck just one note at a time. <laughs> Baby shark. <laughs> no one's feelings were as strong as Mr. Spivvy's. It's evil and it's dangerous. He told everyone who would listen. We'll all be sorry if this thing stays among us. As days went by, the broom seemed as innocent and hardworking as ever. Though it learned how to do many things, sweeping brought it special pleasure. It was, after all, a broom. Occasionally, when there was nothing left to do around the widow's house, it would hop down the road that separated Minishaw and the Spivvy's farms. The road was dirt, and the broom could amuse itself there for hours. One afternoon, two of the Spivvy boys and their dog walked along the road where the broom was happily at work. When they saw what it was doing, they kicked small stones at the broom and swept the side back into the path. The broom ignored them and shuffled off to sweep another part of the road. But the Spivvy boys would not leave it alone. They called the broom names. Yeah, yeah, you, you little stick. When it continued to ignore them, they picked up a couple of sticks and started tapping the broom's handle. Finally, it stopped sweeping. The broom turned to the two boys and knocked them both on the head so hard they fell to the ground in tears. The broom hopped off, but the spivvy dog ran after it, yapping yeah, and spiting at its bristles. The little dog leaped in the air and caught the broom by the handle. Yeah! But he was not there for long. along with a long wooden stake and coils of rope. Mr. Spivvy knocked loudly. When she opened her door, Minna was frightened by what she saw. We've come for the broom! Her neighbor told her. It's beaten my sons and likely done worse to my dog. The poor animal was nowhere to be found. The widow could tell by their faces that the men would not be leaving without her broom. There was nothing she could do to stop them. For a moment, she stood silently and then answered, of course you are right. If it could do such a thing, we must get rid of it. She led the men into her kitchen. It sleeps in here, she whispered, pointing to a closet. If you move it carefully, it will not wake up. The men knew how strong the broom was and hoped the widow was right. They opened the closet door, revealing the slumbering broom. One of the farmers took it out and held it gently against a stake while the others wrapped it in yards of rope. They carried the broom outside, drove the stake into the ground, and gathered straw around it. Mr. Spivvy lit the fire. <laughs> In no time at all, flames turned the broom to ashes. 
Life soon returned to normal around the widow's farm. The Spivvies even found their dog, healthy but hungry, caught in the branches of a tall spruce tree. I see it. Then one morning, Minna Shaw called on her neighbor with frightening news. She had seen the ghost of the broom. It was white as snow and moved through the woods at night carrying an axe. Mr. Spivvy did not believe her. But that night, under a full moon, he watched from a window as the broom's white ghost came out of the woods and circled slowly around his house. The next night it returned, circling even closer. And the night after it came again, tapping the axe lightly on the Spivvy's door. The next morning, Mr. and Mrs. Spivvy packed their dearest possessions and eight children into their wagon. Mr. Spivvy tried to convince the widow to leave with them, but she chose to stay behind with her little farmhouse. She went down the road as the wagon pulled away and waved goodbye to her neighbors. You are a brave woman, Mr. Spivvy called out. That evening, the widow fell asleep in her chair by the fire. She'd been listening to music. Simple tunes played one note at a time on the piano. A gentle tap on the shoulder woke her. She looked up and smiled at the broom. Not a ghost at all, but still covered with the coat of white paint she'd given it. You play so nicely, Minishaw said. The broom bowed, put another log on the fire, and played another tune. <laughs> <laughs> by Emile Zola. I once knew a very nice young man. <laughs> he died last year. What? His life had become a sheer martyrdom. Let me tell you the story of a man killed by advertising. Pierre Landry. was born in Rue Saint-Honoré near the Central Markets, a paradise for idle loafers. His first reading lessons were given to him by his nurse, who made him spell out the signs and bill posters in the streets. He grew to like those, oblo those large oblong yellow and blue pieces of paper so conveniently displayed on the walls and later on, as a young lad roaming the streets, he fell in love with some of the posters. Uh, the ones printed in enormous characters and queer shapes on which there is a lot to read. His father, a retired hoser, had completed his son's education by letting him have the advertisement page to read. Everyone, everyone knows that the large print of the advertisements is easier for children to make out. At the age of 20, Pierre Langerie was orphaned and found himself quite well off. He decided to live entirely for his own pleasure and to exploit every aspect of modern progressive civilization for his own personal benefit. His father had been a worker. He was going to relax and enjoy the fantastic luxury of the golden age, promised him by the advertisements on page four of his paper and on the hoardings. What a mom! This age we live in, mm -hmm. an age of enlightenment and benefits without end. Where can you see anything more moving than those men who devote themselves night and day to the happiness of mankind by producing a constant stream of inventions to provide us with a more peaceful and happy life, and who are even so generous as to put all these delightful things within reach of the most modest purse. <laughs> and to think that these benefactors of mankind even take the trouble to draw our attention to all these wonderful things, great and small. Uh, tell us where to find them, and even how much we'll have to pay for them. <laughs> Some of them we really ought to thank on bended knees for being willing even to lose money on our behalf, and others are quite satisfied merely to cover their expenses. They're working purely in the service of mankind so that we may live richer, peaceful lives. Well, I've already planned how I want to live. I intend to keep up with progress and enjoy all the advantages of the modern world without any further question. 
I want a blissfully happy life. And for that, all I need to consult is the newspapers and posters night and morning and do exactly as they tell me. Oh. It's an infallible guide to true wisdom and happiness is guaranteed. From then on, Pierre's guideline in life was the advertisements in the paper and on the hoardings. He followed them blindly whenever he had a decision to make, and he would never buy or do anything that hadn't been warmly recommended by the publicity men. Every morning, he would religiously scan the papers, conscientiously noting down the new discoveries and products. As a result, his home became a repository of every crack-brained invention or shoddy article on sale in Paris. Indeed, his basic reasoning was not without logic. By keeping abreast of the times and choosing the products, most enthusiastically praised and recommended in rhapsodic terms by the publicity men, he could claim with legitimate pride that he was using the most advanced products of the most highly developed civilization in the world, and he had thus solved the problem of attaining perfection. However, this was only in theory, and unfortunately, the reality became more unpleasant every day. Although everything should have been for the best, in fact, it all went from bad to worse, and the drama now began, which was to make his life a hell on earth. He had bought a plot of filled-in swampland into which his house slowly sank. The house itself had been built according to the latest modern principles. When the wind blew, it shook. And when the rainstorms came, it gently crumbled. The fireplaces, equipped with ingenious smokeless hoods, belched forth asphyxiating fumes. The electric bells remained obstinately silent. The carefully planned modern laboratories turned out to be noisome cesspits. Cupboards provided with special mechanical locks would neither open nor shut properly. In particular, there was the pianola, which sounded like a rather inferior hurdy-gurdy, and a burglar-proof and fireproof safe, which was quietly removed bodily by burglars one fine winter's night. There was also the country cottage that Pierre, Pierre had bought at Arcai, which was quite a different story. Here he experimented with trees cut out of sheet metal and tried cultivating rare plants, which, when they grew, looked like rather poor couch grass. His architect designed water tank, widely advertised, collapsed, <coughs> and he was nearly drowned as well as almost crushed to death. Amidst all these trials and tribulations, Pierre continued to smile blandly, his faith quite unshaken. On the contrary, his confidence grew stronger. Everything isn't yet for the best in the best of all possible worlds. And the most logical way to avoid all these misfortunes is to follow the march of progress even more closely. The reason my water tank collapsed was that my architect wasn't warmly enough recommended. I must find one recommended more strongly. Ah, if I watch the newspapers, I'm bound to achieve perfection and a perfect happiness. Poor Pierre suffered not only in his possessions, but in his person. His clothes would split at the seams. As he was walking down the street, he had bought them from firms offering vast discounts on stocks being cleared, either because of stock taking or a takeover. He would seek out such bargains not through meanness, but solely in order to enjoy all the benefits of the modern world. One day, when I met him, he'd gone completely bald. <laughs> In his tireless pursuit of progress, he had hit on the odd idea of changing the color of his hair from blonde to dark. He applied a liquid which made all his hair fall out to his great delight, since he could now, he claimed, Employ a certain hair lotion guaranteed to give me a head of brown hair twice as thick as my previous one. <laughs> Incidentally, his cheeks and chin were perpetually covered in gashes from the superior modern razors he used. 
His hats went out of shape after a week's wear and the clever little springs designed to open his umbrella never worked when it was raining. I won't even mention all his panic medicines. He had always been strong and healthy. He became emaciated and short of breath and now advertising really started to destroy him. Thinking he was ill, he began to try out all the wonder cures that advertised in such glowing terms and to increase their effectiveness since he was quite at a loss to distinguish between their conflicting claims, all couched in equally high faux language, he took all the medicines at once. <laughs> he also consumed enormous quantities of chocolate, unable to resist the blandishments of the various manufacturers. He used toiletries in great abundance. <laughs> and several times went to have his teeth pulled. Uh, <laughs> he went to have his teeth pulled out only out in order to provide work for numerous philanthropic dentists who swore blind that their extractions would be painless. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Nearly breaking his jaw in the process. <laughs> Advertisements attacked his mind. <laughs> as well as his body. He had bought an extendable book bookcase into which he crammed all the books recommended in newspaper reviews. He invented a very ingenious classification system. He arranged books according to their order of merit, that is to say, according to the degree of enthusiasm displayed by the reviewers, all subsidized by the publishers. He sh his shells groaned under the weight of his collection of rubbish recording all the stupidity and corruption of the age. On the back, of each volume, Pierre carefully stuck the blurb which had caused him to buy it, so that each time he opened it, he knew in advance how he ought to react. He could laugh <laughs> or weep, <laughs> according to the instructions. The outcome of all this was to turn him into a moron. Although, having become more selective and difficult to please in the end, he bought only those books described as outstanding masterpieces, thereby reducing his purchases to some 20 books a week. <laughs> we now reach the last act of this harrowing drama. Having heard a clair of a clairvoyant claiming to cure all ills, he rushed round to consult her about his own non-existent diseases. The, clairvo the clairvoyant obligingly offered to restore his youth. All he had to do was to drink a certain liquid and take a bath. Pierre Landry was convinced that such a potion must be the acme of civilization. He swallowed the drug, jumped into his bath, and regained his youth to such good effect that two hours later, he was discovered there, dead. <laughs> he had a smile on his lips and the look of ecstasy on his face suggested that he died worshiping the great God of advertising. This was no doubt the radical remedy for all ills promised him by the clairvoyant. Even in death, Pierre Landry remained the humble devotee of advertising. In his will, he asked to be embalmed in a casket in accordance with a recently patented instant chemical process. At the cemetery, the coffin burst open, tipping his wretched corpse into the mud. He had to be buried higgedly piggedly with the broken bits of plank. Next winter, the rains rotted the paper mache of his imitation marble tombstone, and his grave was left as an anonymous heap of moldering refuse. been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in earth. 
Now I heard many things in hell also. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how, how calmly I can, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none, passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood turned cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I, I made, made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus, and thus rid, rid myself of the eye forever. forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. <laughs> but, but, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded with what caution. With what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> what a madman have been so wise as this! And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously. For the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And I did this for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into his chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feeling of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he, not to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. <laughs> I fairly chuckled at the idea. And perhaps he heard me. For he moved on the bed, as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness. For the shutters were closed, fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door. And I kept pushing pushing it steadily, steadily, and I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? <laughs> I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole, whole hour, hour I, I did, did not, not move, move a, a muscle. muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening. Just, just as, as I, I have done, done night after, after night, night, hearkening to the death watches on the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan. And I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew it well. 
Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from mom a scream, a die. And now, again, hark! Louder, 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 louder! Villains! Dissemble no more! I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of <coughs> his hideous heart. Have a great night. Bye, you too.